everyone deserves access to competent and ethical professional financial support. And it is out there, whether you're doing it for yourself or for your business, whatever it is, there's support that is available and cost does not have to be a barrier. You're listening to In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we guide you through the forces shaping your business, inside and out. This summer, let's beat the heat, dive back into business with a whole new mindset. I'm your host, Ari Marin. How do you feel about money? Tough question, right? Okay, I'll go first. Money's the thing that allows me to treat myself on occasion. Eat nice food, travel abroad, try new hobbies. On good days, money's fun, but that's on good days. Here's the thing. I'm a certified financial professional. I talk about money every day. I advise people on how to manage their finances, and yet I still feel anxious about it sometimes. And you know what? That's most people. Our relationship to money is emotional. We care. We want to make smart choices, but that can get us in the place of worry. According to one poll in 2023, nearly 50% of small business owners felt stressed about their finances. So how can we keep our mind on the money, but also gain confidence in our business potential? What does it take to build a healthier money mindset? Our guest today thinks about these questions every single day. I'm Sandra Davis. I'm trained as a financial planner, but I serve primarily as a coach because people don't do what you tell them to do. I'm also the program director at Golden Gate University for financial planning programs. Sandra Davis is the person you want to talk money with. She's the founder and director of Sage Financial Solutions, a nonprofit that provides financial education to people from all backgrounds. Not only does she support entrepreneurs and business owners with their planning, she also trains future advisors. And if you want to know how she hit the jackpot and got all her money wisdom, well, let's just say she wasn't born with it. I made so many financial mistakes, Sorry, I changed careers at 40 plus. And my first company, I was managing this huge organization, uh, multi-million dollar budget, and I really worked myself into illness. I literally had two ulcers. That's right. Sandra used to struggle with her finances. Her journey out of insecurity started when she sold her first company, a consulting firm she had run for 20 years through pain and effort. At that point, Sandra wanted to get back into business, but she needed a change. So she took a break, went back to school, got her master's degree in personal financial planning, and launched practice. Now she's been self-employed for 30 years. She runs a successful nonprofit, and she is serene. So in this episode, we take a leaf from her book to turn insecurity into expertise. And it starts with some real honest conversations about what we feel when we spend. Here's Sandra. The truth is there's no aspect of our lives that money doesn't touch. Every single thing that we ever experience has some connection to our financial lives. And so you can have a financial situation that causes instability, scarcity, that is just straight up financial trauma, right? It can also happen the opposite way where there's extreme wealth that has attachments to it, like expectations from family or friends or financial infidelity, you and your partner may be hiding things from each other around money. It can look like hoarding, never feeling that there's enough money. For me personally, I felt financial stress all the time. As a very young person, my family situation became unstable. I was unhoused for a while, which led me to feel like Security wasn't a real thing. I went from being very secure, understanding where, you know, my whole family situation was, to being insecure and unstable. And so what that impacted for me was money was not a pathway to security or stability. When I would get money, I didn't concern myself with keeping it. I didn't think about saving. I didn't understand saving. So there are all kinds of ways that this can show up. Whether we like it or not, We all have feelings about money. Some of us are confident money will come and go. And yes, that impacts our business choices. Sandra has experienced this firsthand. 
I opened my business without having a business plan for one. And what often happens with entrepreneurs is they cover the expenses for their business without making sure that they can pay themselves from their business. And that's one of the things that I did, right? So I really made sure that my business books were in order, but my personal financial situation was not at the same level as my business. And so for the first year or so, I really wasn't paying myself consistently. And I think in large part, I couldn't afford to pay myself well because I didn't do the planning on the front end. I didn't think about what my personal needs were as I was designing my business needs. I always felt that I had to put the firm first. I had to put the business first. And this impacted my ability to be effective overall in my business and in enjoying the services that I was providing for my clients. So you mentioned uh, emotional stress. What are some other warning signs that we don't have a financially healthy mindset? Under-earning is a big one that I see with entrepreneurs. Being uncertain about charging what they really are worth. I see a lot of folks who trade time for dollars, right? When in fact, when I think about my expertise, it's because of what I know, not what I do. There's a lot of time, energy, money, and study that went into me being where I am today, right? So if I price myself at an hourly rate, I can really be harming myself financially because there's a lot of time, energy, money, and study that went into me being where I am today. And so the under-earning the financial trauma, the fear of, you know, clients not coming back, the fear of clients not being willing to pay the fees that we charge. And then also a big thing that I've noticed is waiting for a very long time to hire people, believing that we can do it all. And so a business owner wants to make sure, yeah, that you've got the budget. What does your profit and loss look like? What does your balance sheet look like? But also, are you living in your business in a way that is satisfying for you? The challenge is, how do you maintain that mindset as things change? So that financially healthy mindset has to include your self-care in the midst of challenges. So just investing everything into your business without taking care of yourself first is really the same as not taking care of yourself financially as well. So you heard Sandra. First step towards a better money mindset, unpack your emotions and take care of yourself. Your financial strategy should be a realistic picture in which you are comfortable. If you struggle with chronic stress, you'll have a hard time reaching your goals. So have an honest conversation with yourself. And if you need support, no shame in the process. There is help out there. You've conceived a framework for which you call the continuum of financial well-being. Can you explain this concept to our listeners? Certainly. This came to be because in the area of personal finance, There's no regulation on the terms that you can use. Anyone can hang out a shingle and call themselves anything, right? And so in order to make it more accessible for consumers as well as professionals, I started thinking about how do we want to describe how we work with people? So there are are five pillars to this, and there's fundamentally education, that transfer of knowledge. Do you know what you need to know to be able to navigate your personal financial life? And then there's counseling. And counseling is generally one-on-one or in groups that can help you navigate when there are challenges. So an accredited counselor can help you deal with debt, deal with budgeting, develop a business plan. And then there's coaching. Coaching is more about the transformation of the human. How do you align your beliefs and your behaviors. And then there's financial planning. And financial planning is a comprehensive approach that looks at all areas of your financial life, gathers your data, gathers your information, and then builds a plan as you go through your financial life cycle. And then finally, a relatively new modality is financial therapy. And financial therapy really became more prominent in 2010 when a group of us got together to determine, should this even be a thing? Many of 
of us understood that the work that we were doing was more emotional aspects of financial actions than the dollars and the cents. And so therapy is more about, just as you would imagine any form of therapy, understanding when there might be a diagnosis, understanding how the social and emotional aspects of money can impact our well-being. So the five pillars are education, counseling, coaching, planning, and therapy. And that applies whether you're a practitioner or whether you're a consumer seeking those services. So the five pillars we're talking about here, they're really just tools that you can use for support. And I mean, there's no rule, you know? You might be a solopreneur who needs financial therapy or a COO who could benefit from some coaching. We all have different needs. What matters is what works for you. Well-being can look so many ways, and well-being can be very subjective. I may feel that I have financial well-being, and my numbers say something different. My numbers can say that my business is operating at a loss, but I might love my business, and I feel fine working in my business. So we've got to be cautious about the measures that we're using. I really appreciate the CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, has a scale that has five to 10 questions that incorporates both the reality, the dollars and the cents, and how you feel about the reality, right? And so, you know, there's questions like, I feel like money runs my life. I've worked with people that had more money than they could ever need and were miserable. And I've worked with people who barely had enough to scrape by and were happy and satisfied with their lives. So you might have more money than you could ever need and still feel like money runs your life. You may not have enough and feel like money runs your life. That's where the subjectivity comes in. I think it's important for people to recognize the money matters, but it's not everything. Any typical questions we should ask ourselves to check in? You know, my first question is always, you know, what's the vision? Where am I going? If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, right? And so at first, just knowing where you're going. Consider how do you define success? And then what are the milestones you can recognize along the way? Let me give an example. If you had talked to me three years ago, you would have heard me saying, you know what, Ari, I am building my business. There's some contracts I want to go after. I want to do a whole workplace wellness thing. I had big ideas, right? Big ideas. I made a couple of efforts in that direction and both of the efforts failed miserably. And in this case, those two things that did not go well taught me, you know, Sandra, take a step back. Every time we are approached or we recognize something that we believe is an opportunity, I encourage people to think of it as an option. Only with self-reflection, assessment, and recognizing the financial implications can we determine if it's an opportunity or an obstacle. Me growing at that time would have been an obstacle to how I define success, which is to have a satisfying business that meets my financial needs and allows me freedom to travel. Had I been successful at that, Ari, I would have been miserable. I might have been successful financially. I might have you know, done some great work in the world, but it wouldn't have been right for me. So I invite people to look at how do I care for myself as a business owner while I'm pursuing the vision. On this podcast, we have a range of listeners with different priorities. So I'd like to ask you, what are the typical financial challenges that an entrepreneur might face when launching a new venture? I think the first that I would like to acknowledge is we can sometimes launch into something without thinking the whole thing through. I mean, a a standard business tells you, you know, to look at the competition, you know, look at the, the viability of the market, look at all those things. And all of those things are absolutely valuable and necessary. So I think that that's first. When you're launching a new venture, does your business model align with what you want your business to look like, not only now, but in the long run. When I became a financial planner, I expected my business would die when I do. 
Now, keep in mind, this was 20 years ago. I was in my 40s. Death was not top of mind, right? 25 years later, I've got more years behind me than I have in front of me. And so I didn't think about what the practice should look like. And so now I have a nonprofit agency. I also have an LLC. Now, my nonprofit agency, should I choose to close it, the assets of that nonprofit have to go to another nonprofit. I can't just take the money and run. Whatever's left, I have to donate to another nonprofit. There are implications for each type of venture. And I think it's important for us to understand that and choose the one that's right for us, recognizing that if we go down a path and it turns out to not be the right path, we can change it. We also need to look at how we're hiring our staff. It's not so straightforward. I wish that I'd gone to like a small business administration workshop on hiring employees and all of the implications that that means. I think one of the mistakes that I made in my first company was I hired employees that I knew and they were smart and it was great. You know, the old adage, what got you here won't get you there. It caused my business to stagnate in part because I I had some fears around trust and I didn't trust myself enough first, to be honest, to hire people that I didn't know. And so that that had me at a disadvantage because I needed some skills that I didn't have myself and I didn't know to hire them. Financial health is, is both an individual and a collective question. So in the workplace, how can we look out for others who might be experiencing financial stress too? I think the first thing I'd like to say about that is noticing patterns of behavior. Are people responding differently than they usually do? If people appear to be more stressed than normal, do they appear to be more distracted? When you look at the research on the impact of financial stress on workplace effectiveness, the numbers are staggering. Absenteeism is one aspect of it. And then there's also presenteeism is the word that is used. I'm present, but I'm so busy thinking about my financial situation that I'm not at my best And some of the things that we can do is begin to open up conversations about money. Now, in large part, talking about money is still a big taboo in a lot of places. But I will say this. I believe that people want to talk about money, but do not have a safe place to do so. And so I think that employers who have like lunch and learn, where, you know, learn about student loans, right, learn about uh, budgeting, learn about debt management, can offer them to their employees, not to a specific person, but offering them in general and allow people to do it anonymously. Because sometimes people still feel that if my boss knows that I'm having money trouble, it might speak to my responsibility and therefore they don't have confidence in me in the workplace. So opening up financial wellness programs or recommending them if you don't have them yourself. So if you're an employer that doesn't have that capacity to offer them, learn about them in your area or uh, nationally and make them available as part of, you know, employee assistance packages or just even in your referral packages. It's a nice thing to do. You mentioned earlier that oftentimes they're not listening to what advice you've been giving them. Is that one way to, re- to mitigate that? Or do you have other mechanisms for checking in? What happens when you find out they're not listening to you? As a, a CFP myself, we often see this. Uh, it's frustrating. It's probably the most frustrating part of our job because we get very excited about an idea. We believe in it. We communicate it effectively and nothing. Yeah. So Ari, first, you have my deepest heartfelt care and loving kindness to you because that is really what is true. I have a colleague who says when he's speaking, he'll ask a room full of CFPs, have you ever had a plan blow up because of market behavior? Nobody raised their hands. He says, have you ever had a plan? (laughs) I see you smiling, so I know you know where I'm going. Have you ever had a plan blow up because of client behavior? Everybody raises the hands. Now, that's actually how I got into the field I'm in. That's the reason I became a coach, because I would hear my colleagues say, oh, yeah, I had to fire that client. 
And of course, there are two aspects of that, right? There's you putting yourself as a professional at risk. And then there's also the pain that comes with wanting something for someone and believing that you've given them what will get them where they want to go and then them not doing it. And and I do believe that ethical financial professionals, they care about that. And so they don't want to just take someone's money and they not implement the plan. I also think that what financial professionals can do is to engage early and often with understanding what's going on in the mind of the client. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a therapist, but you can use therapeutic practices. You can say, these are some of the things that I'm thinking about for your plan. When you consider these ideas, what comes up for you? You literally can ask very simple questions as you're building the plan. And when you're noticing, if you're having a follow-up meeting with the client, you're noticing the client saying, well, yeah, no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And they're, they're, they're looking at the action item list that you've given them and nothing is happening. As a coach, my clients build their own action list. And the reason for that is that all the research that the behaviors have done shows that a client is more likely to do their homework if they've given it to themselves. (laughs) If I give a client homework, they may or may not do it, but if they give it to themselves, they are more likely to do it. And then I become an accountability support system rather than someone telling them what to do. The thing with financial support is, it's really like therapy. It needs to come from you or it just won't work. Of course, companies have their part to play. We need to provide resources and make those services available to all. But if you're on the receiving end and you're struggling with money, remember this too. The financial professional has information. They have knowledge. They have context. You are the expert in your own life. No one knows you like you. And so if you are navigating a financial situation that's stressful for you, either by causing it or by having external environment that has created it for you, you know how you're responding to it. So if you're working with someone, whether it's a counselor, a coach, a planner, or a therapist, you want to make sure that you have the confidence in them, that you can trust them with your truth. If someone gives you a financial plan, irrespective of how perfect it may be, but you know you're not going to do it for whatever reason, It's up to you to say, you know, I appreciate this plan, but I'm not doing this. And then they can work with you to find something that will. So I have a question for you. What is your favorite part of what you do uh, as a CFP? The analysis. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy creating something that's tailored for them. I like the, the process of researching, collecting facts, and then really just putting something that's custom fit for this client that I think could actually make a difference. That to me is the big motivator and hopefully seeing them benefit from the advice that I'm giving. I love that. And that's really the wonderful part, right? So it's everyone deserves access to competent and ethical professional financial support. And it is out there, whether you're doing it for yourself or for your business or for your family, whether it's end of life planning, beginning of life planning, kids going to college, whatever it is, there's support that is available and cost does not have to be a barrier. I think that's kind of the one thing that I want to say that we haven't touched on, that there are pro bono services for all of these five pillars. And I think that people would would be served well to even if they're a do-it-yourselfer, to find someone who can be uh, their witness and help them make the plan that is best for them. I always like to say that these are the kinds of services that not only pay for themselves, but produce dividends for you in the long term. And so it's it's a matter of not being short-term focused and worrying about a bill that a financial planner is going to charge or an advisor is going to charge, an attorney, whomever, that's going to save you money over time. And more importantly, Uh, help alleviate some of those uh, potential for stressors down the road where suddenly you wish that that maybe you had taken some advice or that things had turned out differently. 
I love that, Ari. And I'll tell you, my partner calls that tuition cost, where we decide to go do something on our own, right? And think, oh, I can figure, I'm smart. I can do that. And it's not that we're not smart. It's just that we see half. We see what we see, and we don't see what's behind us. So it, it is a profession. So I agree with you. And I would rather pay a professional than learn the hard way. <laughs> so... See, folks, it's not just me saying it. Getting a financial professional to help you is an investment for your business. And this work can start in many places. If you're thinking about hiring a financial professional, there are a couple of places that you can do that. If you're thinking about financial therapy, there's the Financial Therapy Association. If you're thinking about a certified financial planner, some institutions that you might already be working with may have a CFP. There's also the CFP Board of Standards has a list of financial planners there as well. And there you'll know that people are also in good standing. Financial education, if you're looking for workshops and those kinds of things, I would start in your neighborhood. The reason for that is your neighborhood community-based organizations are going to be sensitive to what's happening in your community. Like I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. The financial education that happens in the Bay Area pays attention to what's happening in the Bay Area, cost of living, all of those things, what's available to people and that sort of thing. If you're looking to become one of these professionals, there are many ways that you can start uh, college programs all over the country. As I've mentioned, I teach at Golden Gate, and so of course I'm a bit biased, but there are programs all over the country that can help you become a financial professional, either in education, counseling, coaching, planning, or therapy. We're coming to the end of our time together. So let me ask you a couple of final questions. If you had to summarize, what are the main drivers of financial wellness? So this is my favorite part. So the main thing is know where you are, know where you're going, and then build a plan to get you there. I use the example of when you walk into a place or a mall or any place that you've never been before. You walk up to this map and the map has a little star or a red dot that says you are here and then you take a look at what else is on the map right and it shows you one of the places that you might want to go some people have to start with the dot this is my current situation other people start with the vision this is where i'm trying to go and back into the dot right so this is where i'm trying to go many many people can successfully have a do-it-yourself financial plan. I recommend that even if you're a do-it-yourselfer, have a professional look at it, primarily because we cannot see our own blind spots. I have a master's degree in financial planning. I'm a master certified coach. I am a certified mindfulness teacher. I am a financial behavior specialist, and I have a financial planner. Right? I have someone who looks at what I think I know and helps me navigate my blind spots. So the main thing is know where you are, know where you're going, and then build a plan to get you there. A business is a creative venture. It's something we're bringing to life with our own point of view. So we might start from different places, but what matters is where we're going and how we're taking care of ourselves along the way. Sandra's story is a reminder of that. As someone who started knowing nothing about money, and being terrified of math, I can't even tell you. I was so terrified of math that I wouldn't even take the math placement exam. So the idea of financial planning, right? I was like, oh God, I'll never be able to do it. But I created my own personal no shame zone, right? And even with the masters, even at 60 plus, I have learned to leave the shame behind. I learned the lesson and I leave the shame. I walk my talk. I practice what I share with others, whether it is the dollars and the cents or the vision and the values. Leaving the shame behind, that's a mantra we want to champion. So whether you want to get a healthy start on a new venture or you're at a turning point and you need to change your relationship with money for good, remember this, we all have money feelings. Your early life has an impact on your finances and that can be hard to unpack. So be honest with yourself. Try to find the root causes for your struggles. What are your emotions towards money and why? Caring for yourself will help you make better financial decisions. When you're building a financial plan, think about your values. Your goal is to be comfortable. That might mean having a very structured role or flexibility 
suit your lifestyle. But before you make any major decision, build a vision. What are you aiming for? Assess the market. Are your goals aligned with the current landscape? It's not easy to tell. So if you're not sure what to do or you're starting to feel the pressure, seek support. Working with a financial professional is a true investment into your well-being. It can help you heal your relationship with money, get educated, or even just motivate. We all need a little help sometimes, and there are a ton of resources out there. Last but not least, know where you are, know where you're going, have a plan, prepare to pivot. Life is going to happen. Who would have known that the last four years would have had the impact on our work lives that it has had? The only constant is change. And the more able we are to navigate those changes by taking really good care of knowing our numbers and knowing our vision and values, we can pivot with ease in most situations. I want to thank Sandra Davis for talking the talk and walking the walk with us today. We hope our conversation left you inspired to create your own no shame zone and adopt a whole new money mindset. As for me, I'll see you next time for another episode of In Good Companies. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Our production team is Natalie Barron and Edie Pangeli. Our executive producer is Daniel Cornell. This podcast is made in collaboration with the team at Lower Street. Writing and production from Lise Lavati. Sound design and mixing by Ben Cranell. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank and its affiliates make no representation or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests in this podcast are solely their own current opinions regarding the subject matters discussed in the podcast and are based on their own perspectives. Such views, perspectives, and opinions do not reflect those of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates or the companies in which any guest is or may be affiliated. The production and presentation of this podcast by Cadence Bank does not imply the expression of any opinion on part of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates.